I am a little energetic. Is that okay with you guys? Is that all right? I love the Bible. I love the church. I believe that the local church is the hope of the world, and God tells us to gather here. So when I come in and get outside of the Bayside bubble for a little bit and expand my horizons, flap my wings a little bit, and here we are in West Sacramento with this brand new church that I've never been to, that excites me. So if I haven't met you guys, my name is Tyler. I would love to shake your hand, talk to you after. I actually get to serve as one of the high school pastors at Bayside Church, which is a blast. Uh, I get to work with this good-looking dude in the front row. Ladies, I'm telling you what. He's single and ready to mingle, all right? This is my friend James Rogers, who's one of the best-looking dudes you're ever going to see. Like, even if you're in a relationship, just after this service, just look at him. Just so you can say you did. You'll feel better about yourself, I promise. It is well worth your time. But he is looking for a partner. So if you are single, please come up, talk to us. James, you're welcome. You're welcome, my man. James is one of the high school pastors as well at our Folsom campus at Bayside. We have a few different campuses, and so we get to work together. I get to work on a team. I love working with people. It is amazing. Haven't always lived in Sacramento. My wife and I were here. We've been here now for almost two years. We actually moved from Southern California, which is where we were for like 15, 16 years. Uh, my wife and I have been together for a long time. We're going on five years of marriage, July 1st, which is kind of crazy. Wow. I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you. Five years, July 1st. And then, uh, gosh, but before that, we were together for like eight years, eight and a half years before we got married. This is my gorgeous bride. You guys, I get to go home to her tonight. Like, I'm the luckiest dude in the world. It's amazing. And I've known Allie for a long time. In fact, we've, we've been friends since we were in middle school. That's where we first met. I asked her to freshman homecoming and game, set, match, people. That was it. She didn't want to go out with any other guy. I don't know why, but I didn't want to go out with any other girl. It just works. I love how God works like that. He just brought us together. And we both went to school at Azusa Pacific University, go Cougs, down in uh, L.A. And, uh, and then we got married right after graduation. We've been together ever since. We were at a church in Fullerton, then Anaheim, right by Disneyland, uh, for a couple, actually, no, for pretty much our entire upbringing. And then for three years, we were at a small church in Los Angeles, about 100, 150 people. So we went from like a couple thousand to 100, 150 to Big Bayside. So I'm telling you what, my experience with church has been so fun. I love the different sizes of church, the different complexities of church, the different traditions of church practice. I love being here tonight in a Russian Baptist church. Is that right? Did I get it right? People, I'm excited to be with you tonight. This is going to be good stuff. I don't know how long you guys have been here, but from everything I can tell with your staff and just the way this is set up, this is so cool. And I was telling you a little bit about my wife um, because I love my wife and there's a lot of things I love about her. But one of the things that stands out to me about my wife is she's only 26 years old and Allie, that's her name, Allie, is one of the wisest people that I know. Like, I know a lot of wise people, but for her age, Allie stands alone. She's just been given the gift of wisdom. The Bible says that wisdom is a spiritual gift given to people by God, and yes, we can grow in wisdom, but it is a gift, and Allie has that gift, and man, she is just wise beyond her years. And you would think that by me being with Allie for so long, like, it just always rubs off on me, right? Like, I'm just gleaning from her wisdom. I'm just absorbing it from my wife, right? Hasn't always worked like that. I'll give you a fun story. We're dating back in college. We're up in the Sierra Mountains going on this hike. And when we start this hike, we're at about 10,000 feet. And just to let you guys know, when you go to 10,000 feet and start climbing, it's hard to breathe. Or I don't know if you have, any of you guys have experienced that before. I'm sure you guys have climbed higher than that. But we're going on this hike. It's called Treasure Lakes. And we're going from 10,000 feet to about 12,500 feet. And if you guys know anything about hiking, there's, there's a, a, a type uh, or a part of a hike that's called switchbacks. Anybody know what switchbacks are? Yeah, they're straight from the pit of hell, all right? Switchbacks are gnarly. Switchbacks are literally is a trail that is taking you straight up the mountain, but they're trying to be nice about it, which seems like a screwed up way to be nice. Instead of taking you from point A to point B in a straight line, which would be crazy hard, switchbacks go back and forth. So you're slowly making your way up this grade, right? Left, right, left, right. But they're steep. And I'll tell you what, I'm an excited guy. I love the outdoors. I love the mountains. That's where I feel God. That's where I get to be myself. Brisk mountain air. Let's go. I love a good challenge. So here we go. We take off on this hike. And my wife, I mean, she's a stud. She was a volleyball player in high school, but she likes to en enjoy the journey. You know what I mean? 
You guys ever been with people on a journey or an adventure like that where they're just in it, they're along for the ride, you know? They're like, wow, I'm going to enjoy this hike and look at the butterflies and the bees and the birds, and it's all good. It's God's creation. I'm like, let's go. We got a destination to make. We're not hiking this thing for nothing. Let's go. I want to get to this lake. Like, that's the goal. That, why are we doing it? I don't want to look at the butterflies. Like, let's go to the lake. That's where we're going. Come on. So I start hiking, right? And that's my mentality. And pretty soon, pretty soon, because I'm going, I'm a little impatient. I start getting a little more ahead, a little more ahead, a, a little bit more ahead of my wife. And I can tell with the elevation, me kind of leaving her, so we're separating. You know, now I'm 10 feet ahead, 20 feet ahead, 30 feet ahead. You guys, the entire time, isn't this the funniest thing? Wisdom's knocking at the door. I hear this voice that's telling me, slow down, idiot. Slow down. You're not doing this for yourself. You're here with your girlfriend. We're just dating at the time. Slow down. Enjoy the journey together. That's wisdom. That's, well, probably, hopefully, the Holy Spirit speaking to me. But like we often do, I decided in that moment not to listen because we got a destination. We got a goal to make. So here we go, right? And I just remember I continue to walk fast. I continue to go fast. And I keep saying, this is me, positive Tyler, right? We're almost there, babe. It's not that much farther. Last set of switchbacks just over the hill. She's looking. I can tell she's getting aggravated. I look back, and even though she's kind of far, she's getting red in the face, just huffing, puffing, elevation. We're getting 11,000, 12,000 feet. She's sweating. We don't have a whole lot of water left over. And all the time the voice is you gotta stop you gotta go back with her you gotta go back with her but I don't so I just keep walking and we're walking and we're moving and finally I mean after like the third or fourth time I go babe we are almost there just over this ridge you can do it you can do it I know you can do it it's just over this ridge never experienced this with my wife before just my girlfriend at the time I look back all of a sudden I know I poked the bear I've taken it one step too far. She is about to boil over until finally she explodes. She looks at me and she goes, Tyler, stop. I said, look back. I'm like, baby, you okay? She's like, you keep telling us that it's almost there. You don't know that. <laughs> There's certain times in a man's life where you're just terrified to death. <laughs> You know what I mean? Where you're like, uh -oh. <laughs> that was the wrong move. I messed up bad. I remember it took my girlfriend yelling at me for the point to sink in. So finally I walked back with her. We take a break. I'm not saying a word. I'm so scared. I've never seen her like this. If you know my wife, this is very uncharacteristic of Allie. So I'm sitting with her, and we take a rest, and we take our sip of water, and we start walking again together. And I tell you guys this story because we wanna, we're talking about wisdom tonight. And I tell you this story because there are so many times in our lives where we decide to act foolishly instead of acting wisely. Anybody with me tonight? Come on now. Come on now, we're all messed up sinners, that's all right. We serve a Savior who's all full of grace and truth and love. We mess up more often than we get it right. Am I the only one in the house tonight? There are so many times in our lives when we act foolishly. We choose to please ourselves. We choose to do what we want. We choose to feel what, we choose to do what feels good for us in the moment instead of what we know is the wise thing to do in this situation. I got good news here tonight for you, friends and family, guys and girls, people here at Bright Church. I got good news for you here tonight. Wisdom is not beyond you. Wisdom is not outside of your grasp. You know how I know that? Because the Bible says so. The Bible says that wisdom is from God, and he wants to give it freely to us. That comes from Proverbs chapter 2. You can look it up. The Bible says that wisdom is a gift given from God to us, and he wants to give it to us if only we would take it and accept it. And some of you might be here tonight, and you're saying, what is wisdom? Like, really, what is it all about? Well, I did some advanced research this week, and so I went on to Wikipedia. It's an internet site. And I got from Wikipedia, because I wanted to get it right, it says this, that knowledge, right, we all know what knowledge is, right? Knowledge is the accumulation of facts and information. So it's, it's the, the nuts and bolts of the situation. Two plus two equals four. That's knowledge, right? It's one thing to know things about God, but do we actually know God? You see, I think a lot of Christians today know things about God. They know things about the Bible, but is that translating to the heart? You know, we might have knowledge about God, but are we seeking God's wisdom? 
Do we actually know our creator? Do we know our savior? Do we know our Jesus? Because knowledge is the accumulation of facts and information, but wisdom is the synthesis of knowledge. Someone very smarter than me wrote this. Wisdom is the synthesis of knowledge and experiences into insights that deepen one's understanding of relationships and the meaning of life. That was a mouthful. I'm going to read it one more time. Wisdom is the synthesis of knowledge and experiences into insights that deepen one's understanding of relationships in the meaning of life. So wisdom is more than knowledge. Wisdom takes knowledge, it merges it together with insights and experiences that deepen one's understanding of the meaning of life. And in the Christian faith, wisdom is something that deepens our understanding, deepens our appreciation, deepens our knowledge, deepens our experience of creator God. That's wisdom. Wisdom. Bible says that wisdom comes from God. I love Craig, Grosch- Craig Groeschel, pastor in Oklahoma, says this in his new book, Divine Direction. Wisdom is God's navigational tool for helping us make decisions about the life we want to live. Now, if we were to be honest and I said, do you want to live a good life or a bad life? I bet half of you would say I live a bad life. You're all liars, right? If I ask you, you want to live a good life, of course, we want to live a good life. We want to live a fulfilling life, a purpose-filled life. We want to live a meaningful life. Wisdom is God's navigational tool for helping us make decisions about the life we want to live. And this wisdom is God's desire for your life, for my life. The author of Proverbs goes on to say, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord, having a deep reverence and admiration for God Almighty, is the beginning of wisdom. So you're sitting here tonight, you're saying, okay, that's great. Wisdom is important for my life. Cool. How do I access it? You're in the right place. Wisdom comes from God. God wants to give you wisdom. All you got to do is ask. You got to seek him. You got to go for it. And that's our big idea for tonight. Seek wisdom. Find God. I didn't need to draw this sentence out any longer. Seek wisdom. Find God. You seek wisdom with all you have. You're going to find God because it comes from him. You seek wisdom with all you have out of a pure heart. You're going for it. Pure intentions to get closer to God and closer to others. Jesus said, top two commandments, greatest two commandments in the world. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You love God with everything you have. And secondly, you love your neighbor as yourself. So we love upwardly and we love outwardly. That's what we're called to do. You seek wisdom and you find God. But there's another reason why this matters and a less positive reason. You see, if we were to be real honest with ourselves, today wisdom isn't all so popular especially for our millennial generation. Most of us in this room come from the millennial generation, and a lot of us from the millennial generation, even if we grew up in the church, most millennials today uh, operate under the assumption that what's good for you may not necessarily be good for me, but that's cool because you do you, I do me. As long as we're happy, everything's cool, right? You guys hear this? You hear from your friends? You might think that yourselves. That's just normally what we operate under. We don't like wisdom. Instead, we like individuality. We like self-instant gratification, right? We want to be pleased. We want to be gratified right here, right now. We like convenience. That's why things like Chick-fil-A are so flippin' awesome. Because you can go to Chick-fil-A or you can go to Taco Bell at 2 in the morning and you might have the voice inside your head that's going, is this the best decision for me to eat at 2 in the morning? Should I stuff four gorditas into my belly at 2 a.m.? Yes, the answer is always yes. Why in our generation? Because it's quick, easy, and accessible, and it's instantly gratifying. We want it. The thing that bugs me the most about Chick-fil-A, and let's be honest, they're closed on Sundays, and they're obeying the Bible, and I'm mad about that because I want a lemonade after church on Sundays, that nice, sweet tea that Chick-fil-A has or their chicken sandwich. Come on, let's be honest. We go to places like Starbucks, and we don't even wait in line anymore. There's a Starbucks app where we want it so Immediately that we order it online so that when we walk in, we literally just walk into the store, grab our drink, and walk out as if we're robbing the place. But we're not, because you already paid it with Apple Pay or PayPal on your phone, and you walk out of there, right? There's this thing called Amazon Prime Now. Amazon Prime Now delivers tons, thousands of items. Just go to Amazon. You'll find this out for yourself. Within an hour, as if Prime two-day free shipping wasn't enough. (laughs) Got to have it now. One of our interns last year ordered ice cream. She had it in 90 minutes. 
ice cold ice cream. I'm like, how do they do that? How do they keep it cold? I love ice cream. I need to do this. And I never have. I don't know why, because I don't want to cave into the system. Right? All these things because we want to be instantly gratified. We want to act and we want to act now. We don't want wisdom. We don't want it. Because wisdom is that voice inside of you, the Holy Spirit, that's going, you should wait. You shouldn't do this. You should do that. It's not the best decision for you. This is the right choice. Most of the time, our conscience is telling us to do the exact opposite. So we would rather not have it. We want to be in control so badly. But you know what's so crazy about control? The Bible speaks directly against it. One of the fruits of the Spirit is to have self-control. Proverbs 16, 9 says this, coming up behind me. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Isn't that a great verse? We can plan. Let me tell you guys, like I'm an extrovert, I love people, but I like making a plan. I like to be doing stuff. I told you on the hike, well, yeah, I had a plan. We had a destination. We're going to the lake. I don't care if you're tired, babe. Let's keep walking. Let's go. We're making, we've got to make progress. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our step. Do we have free will? Absolutely. The Bible is clear about that. But who ultimately controls our destiny? Yeah, someone said it. Who ultimately controls our destiny? God. The Almighty Creator, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. If you're here tonight and if you don't know God, that is totally, totally okay. You are so welcome here. We believe that in the beginning, God, that there was a Creator, God, who literally spoke creation into being. You think about how vast this solar system is. The planets, the galaxy, billions of them. And Earth is just a speck. And God created all that. God created all that, but just by speaking it, and there it was, and there it was. I don't know if that rocks your boat, but that rocks mine. We get to serve that God. I'm sorry, I'm like going off my notes for a second. The God who created the world and the solar system and the stars just by spitting them out of his mouth, we get to serve that God. That God came down in flesh 2,000 years ago and took our punishment, our pain, took your punishment, my pain, on his shoulders, took him to the cross, died, was buried three days, rose to never die again, proving that he has ultimate authority over death so that we would never have to experience eternal separation from the Father. That's our God. That's our God. We can make our plans. That God determines our steps. We can make plans. God loves it when we have plans. We just got to be seeking him. Seek wisdom. Find God. God loves our plans. I'll I'll give you this. Okay, I'm just going to be real with you. He'll often disrupt our plans. Like that happens all the time. (laughs) You don't need me to tell you that. All right, we can have plans and we can think we're going one way or things are going a certain way. And God's like, nope, I got left curveball coming out of left field. You don't even see this one coming. Boom disrupts our plans. And then we start pointing the finger. God, why'd you do that? Why'd you do that? Usually missing in the entire situation. He's trying to teach us something. He's trying to show us something. But it's so aggravating, right? Because we don't know what it is. Because again, we like control. Do you see how this works? And God's like, Scott, trust me. I sent my son. I took your punishment. I created the universe. Do you not think I hold your destiny in my hands? I got you. Guys and girls here tonight, I don't know what you're carrying. I don't know what you're bringing. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your struggles are, your fears are, your anxiety is. I don't know that. God does. Does someone in this room know that? We are to love God with everything we have. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. God wants us to live in authentic, engaging, fulfilling relationships with other people. Do you have somebody in your life who you're real with? Who knows your deepest, darkest insecurities? Do you have a friend, a couple? Does someone know the real you, the real you, the real you, the real me. Because I'm telling you what, if no one does, it's a scary place to be. Guys, I've been there. I've tried to carry the weight on my own shoulders. Ladies, my wife has tried to carry the weight on her own shoulders. And it doesn't work. You need people in your life you can confide in. We're not perfect. That's why we needed a savior. So start opening up. 
Start opening up. And you know what helps with this, with the ability to lose control, let go of control? It's wisdom. But here we are, still today, struggling with it. You know why? Because we've been struggling with it since day one. Adam and Eve, you read it in the first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1, 2, sorry, first three chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. First two chapters, God creates the universe, speaks it, literally, with his breath, into existence. Man, everything's great. Paradise, garden, walking with God, awesome. Chapter 3 comes, <laughs> everything goes south. Sin enters the world, screws everything up, just like it always does, right? Adam and Eve, chilling in the garden butt naked, and they're just hanging out, eating fruit, naming animals, doing whatever they want. Life's great. That's a good life, people. You don't got to be a rocket scientist to admit that is a good life. That's a great life. I kind of want that life. But it got him in trouble, right? Because God just gave him one command. Hey, you can eat from any tree you want in the garden. Just don't eat from, uh, from, the, tree, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Just a- anything else, just not that one. Of course, you tell a little kid not to cross the street. What's the first thing they do? They go across the street. Right? And so all of a sudden, Eve's eating. Let's not forget, fellas, Adam was with her. The text says that. But Eve's eating, and all of a sudden, the snake comes around, right? And he just starts hissing. And I don't know necessarily what the snake looked like, but I imagine he just came on kind of creepy-like, and he's like, what's going on? (laughs) Adam and Eve, what's he up to? What you doing? All of a sudden, they're like, what the heck is this talking snake doing? Why are we rocking with him? This is weird. It's like a hypnotist. And all of a sudden, he goes, hey, you see that fruit? Looks good. You want some of that? Okay, I'm going to stop because it's just kind of weird at this point. <laughs> like, what am I saying up here? I'm going to get fired. And it doesn't take long for Eve to say, you know what, that actually does look pretty good. I'm going to eat some of that fruit. And it doesn't take long for Eve to look to Adam, who was with her. Come on, fellas, take some ownership, right? Adam's right there. And she gives it to him, and he eats it right away. And all of a sudden, sin enters the world because of one act of disobedience. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal, okay? I don't necessarily know, like, the full extent of the details of this story, But all I know is I've been married for almost five years. And if I come home and my wife is naked eating fruit, I'm going to hop in. All right? Let's tell you that right now. Like without thought, I'm joining in on that party. Years and years and years ago, because of one mistake, one mistake, we struggle with this today. A couple who didn't act wisely. A couple who didn't act wisely. And it just goes on and on and on. We actually get to Genesis, and we read of a story of a guy named Joseph. Now, Adam and Eve were a negative example. Joseph is actually a positive example. Joseph, if you don't know the story, I'm just going to refresh you a little bit, right? You have Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Don't let me sing alone. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the... I'm done. You guys are not with me on that one. Abraham. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. One of them is Joseph. The other brothers get jealous of Joseph. Joseph is sold into slavery, sold to the Ishmaelites. He actually makes his way all the way to Egypt, which is miles away from his hometown, stripped, separated from his father and his 11 brothers for a long, long time. Joseph is thrown into the Egyptian slave system. He actually becomes the servant or the slave of Potiphar. Potiphar is actually one of the Egyptian rulers under Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the top dog. You think El Presidente. You think king. You think ruler when you think of Pharaoh. Potiphar, just under that guy. Joseph is serving in his household. Here's where we pick up in the text. Follow with me. Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. It says, so he, Potiphar, left in Joseph's care everything he had with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Complete trust. Isn't that crazy? Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. (laughs) Pretty forward, isn't it? Not even like, hey, good looking, what's cooking? You know, she's just straight into, hey, come to bed, come have sex with me. Wow, quality woman right away. Verse 8, but he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. 
Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. Talk about some wisdom in a young man. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak. Now she's grabbing at him. Okay, people, this is stepping up a notch. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Question, do you think Joseph knew what he was getting himself into when he left his cloak with her? Do you think this woman was to be trusted? Do you think Joseph knew, if I leave my cloak with her, I'm a goner? You bet he did. Yet he acted wisely. He acted with integrity. He acted with the conviction of the Spirit of God, which was alive and inside of him. In the midst of a terribly difficult situation, Joseph took the higher ground. Fellas, that's an example for us to follow. Ladies, that's an example for us to follow. Joseph acts with wisdom, with integrity, with courage, knowing what's about to happen to him. When she saw, verse 13, that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. So now she completely fabricates this lie to pin him for attempted rape. Verse 16, she kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. Okay, now she's talking to her husband, Potiphar. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. The guy who loved Joseph is burning with anger at him for good reason, right? At least so he thought. Joseph's master took him, Potiphar took him, and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Have you found yourself in a difficult situation because you were unwilling to sacrifice your convictions? Wisdom isn't the most popular thing in our culture. Wisdom isn't always going to make sense. Wisdom doesn't always lead to an easy path, as we see with Joseph. But as you guys know, as the story ends, how does the story of Joseph end? You guys know? I encourage you this week to go and finish it. It's brilliant. Not easy. What happens after this? How long is he in prison for? You guys know? Years. He gets thrown into prison for years. He eventually gets out. God exalts him. He has to go through all this drama with his family, but finally they are reunited. I'm telling you what, you guys, wisdom will not always make sense in the moment. In fact, it very rarely will, but it always, always comes through because if you seek wisdom, you find God. Joseph knew if he seeks wisdom, he finds God, but there's going to be opposition There will always be opposition. Why? Because anything that God starts, the enemy opposes. Anything that God starts, the enemy opposes. You guys got to know. You guys got to know that the enemy is like a roaring lion, the Bible says, looking, prowling around like a roaring lion. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a lion. James and I were just talking about being in Africa, but I've been on a safari in Africa before, and I've seen these big cats in the wild, and I'm telling you what. When you're facing a four, five, six, seven hundred pound lion who runs 30 to 45 miles per hour with teeth and claws, you don't want to mess with it. I was in this van and there comes the lion and he just rests on the tire three feet from my face. A tiny little van with a window. And I said, all this guy would have to do would, li- would be to lift his paw and push. And here goes our van tumbling over, and he would have a feast. That's all he would have to do. Beasts are massive. Those cats, you don't mess with lions. And that's what scripture says. We have an enemy who's prowling around 
like a roaring lion, ticked off, hungry, looking for someone to devour. It says, resist him, standing firm in your faith. That comes from the book of 1 Peter in the New Testament. We face opposition all the time, you guys. After the dove comes the devil. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Amazing God moment. Amazing. What's the next thing that happens to Jesus? He goes in the wilderness for 40 days, and he's tempted by the devil. You guys have this incredible high moment. Maybe you go to camp. Maybe you go on a college retreat. Maybe you're just in your room on your knees. Oh my gosh, this should be amazing if this is you. I hope and pray that it is. And you just have this divine interaction with God and you are just praying and you are worshiping and you might even cry because you are so close in that moment to the spirit of God. That is amazing. Just know, just know the enemy is not stopping. The enemy is not stopping. He is the biggest party pooper in history. You want to know how I know that? Because the enemy knows his fate. Book of Revelation says the enemy knows that he's done. The enemy had his chance. The, Satan, Lucifer, formerly an angel of God, was in charge of worship for the Almighty God. And he wanted to be like God. In fact, he thought he was God. In fact, he thought he was better than God. You can read this in Isaiah and Ezekiel in the Old Testament. And it said that Lucifer, which was his name, formerly an angel, was cast down like the morning star, thrown out of heaven, thrown out. He had his chance. He knows his fate is eternal damnation, and he is trying to take everybody down with him that he can. You think you're just moseying through life, walking around, your actions don't really have a big effect on people, don't really have a big effect on you in the long run? I'm sorry, I got a truth bomb for you tonight. You're wrong. You're living in denial. I don't mean to offend you. I just want to tell you the truth. You have an enemy that is prowling around trying to devour you. Got some good news for you, though. You got a God who's so much stronger than that. You got a God who's so much stronger. You got a God who cast down Lucifer out of heaven. You got a God who in the book of Job, it says that the devil comes. <laughs> this is so crazy. The devil has to ask for God's permission to torment Job. Like, do you guys get that? The devil can't do anything on his own without God's permission. Do you under, like, if you read the Gospels, right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Oh, some awesome stories, some awesome stories. And you have these stories where Jesus co consistently is confronted with demon-possessed individuals, and the demons actually speak through these people. I'm not trying to get too spiritual. It's, it's the Bible. And these demons are speaking through these individuals to Jesus. And do you know what they say in every circumstance? Jesus, we know who you are. Don't torture us. When the last time you saw a demon or we're confronted with some spiritual warfare. But you don't mess with demons. They're scary. They're terrified of Jesus. Do you guys understand that you have the spirit of God that lives, resides in you? The book of James says, at the name of Jesus, the demons shudder. <laughs> at the name of Jesus, oh, Jesus, Jesus, your name, your name makes darkness tremble. Literally, that's from the book of James. Like the Lion King. You guys seen the Lion King, the movie? You know when the three hyenas are all hurled together and they go, oh, Mufasa. Woo! Woo! Say it again, Mufasa. Woo! Makes them shake. That's like demons, except there's no laughing. They're terrified. That's the God that we serve. Isn't that so cool? That's the God that we serve. So know that you don't got to be afraid as you walk through life. You're asking for wisdom and you're terrified, thinking, how the heck am I going to become a wiser person? We're going to put some legs on this thing right now. Is that cool with you guys? I'm going to end it right here. Next step. So I got three pieces, pieces of advice for you. I want to encourage you, pray with you. We're going to worship together, and then we're gone. Is that cool with you guys tonight? Next steps, talking about how to get wisdom right here. The first thing that I want to encourage you guys with this is ask, what is the wise thing to do? In any situation, in any situation, this is one of the best questions you can ask. What is the wise thing to do? What is the wise thing to do in my life? What is the wise thing to do in this situation? What is the wise thing to do in my marriage? What is the wise thing to do in my relationship with God? What is the wise thing to do in my friendship? What is the wise thing to do? Why are we asking that question? Because most of the time we don't know the answer. You know who does? God. 
You're asking him, God, what is the wise thing to do? And then you wait, and you listen. I told you, we don't like to wait. We don't like to listen in our culture. We like to talk. We like to add, act. We like to move from point A to point B as quickly as we can. Andy Stanley actually came up with this. If you guys know, he's a big, awesome leader, pastor, author from Atlanta, Georgia. And he said, in any situation, always ask, what is the wise thing to do? So guys and girls here tonight, I just challenge you. I'm not saying, I'm not saying this is the greatest piece of advice ever. I'm just saying try it this week. Put it into practice. Next thing that you face, huh, mint chip or rocky road, what is the wise thing to do? Just kidding, probably in a situation a little more <laughs> serious than that. But ask yourself that question, what is the wise thing to do? Number two, number two, act. Sorry, I think I enunciated that part of the sentence a little early. Act. Surround yourself with wise people. Surround yourself with wise people. I got to tell you guys this. People make us better. Now, there are certain individuals that do not make us better. All right, as that saying goes, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Right? So true. People that you hang out with are going to have the most influence over your life. And sooner or later, you're going to start acting like them. They're going to start impacting you guys. It's just life and how it works. Surround yourself with some wise people. I remember a couple years ago, I was at the Thrive Conference 2015, and there was this barbecue outside one time. And I remember I just hop in line. And it had been a couple hours. It was lunchtime. I was so hungry. I love burgers, right? And we hop in. We're getting this burger. And all of a sudden, there's like this tall, skinny man who's probably like 70 years old or so. And he's, he's just, he hasn't said a word. He's just, you know, bun, patty, ketchup, tomato, onion, lettuce. He just starts going. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. I haven't met this guy. So I introduce myself, and he introduces himself. His name is Kent Tucker. And we just start casual conversation. And literally, before we get to the end of the line, I had decided, I made the decision in my mind, this is a guy that I want to hang out with. This is a guy that I can tell is walking with the Lord. You ever met someone who you just want to listen to? You don't want to say two words to because you feel like you're wasting their time. You just want to hear what they have to say because God's speaking to them and they got to have some good stuff to say. So literally, I just said, I looked at him and I'm like, Kent, I'm looking at, but he's like 6'6". Six, six. I'm like, Kent, uh, I know we just met, but can I have dinner with you? <laughs> like, literally, that's what I said. And he looked at me, and he smiled. He looked down at me and smiled, and he's like, absolutely, Tyler. So for the next hour and a half, I just picked this guy's brain. I asked him, how do you spend time with the Lord? What's a relationship with God like for you? Um, what have you learned most about people in your life? I mean, and this guy had stories, stories. I said, Kent, when you wake up in the morning, what is the first thing you do? And of course course. And this was in complete humility. He said, first thing I do is fall on my knees and I just start thanking God for every good gift in my life. I'm like, I am such a horrible person. <laughs> I never do that. But I want to keep talking to you. Why? Because wise people make us better. Wise people make us better. I'm telling you what, guys and girls, if you don't have wise people in your life, you need to go out and find them. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. It's not about perfection. It's about surrounding ourselves with people who have incredible life experience, who are walking with God, who have a heart for others, who walk with humble humility and grace. Surround yourself with people like that. They're going to start rubbing off on you. You're going to glean from them. You're going to learn from them. You're going to be glad you did. And this third thing is this. Always, always talk less and listen more. Can I be honest on this last one? I wrote this one for me. Talk less and listen more. My wife said this, ask more questions than you answer. Ask more questions than you answer. I told you she's wise. <laughs> That's why I hang out with her. She's amazing. What would happen in life if we started to ask more questions than we answer? What would happen in life? I I'm just wondering. I don't have the answer. I think it would help us, but I don't know exactly how. If we would talk less and listen more. You ever met somebody who just talks your face off? Who just won't shut up? Like, you're like, please stop talking at any point in juncture. If you just want to shut your mouth, that would be great. You ever met those people? Like, you're not trying to be rude, you're just trying to be honest, right? Those people generally aren't people we want to hang out with. But if you meet someone who knows who they are, who knows who they are, therefore they know whose they are. And because they know whose they are, as God's child, they know who they are. And they operate with humility and grace and gentleness and kindness. Those are the people that you want to hang out with. There's something about them. When I was in line with Kent Tucker, it took me a great 12 seconds to recognize there's something different about this guy. 
and I just wanted to hang out with him. And guys, he wouldn't have shared any of that stuff with me unless I asked him, and he only did it out of the goodness of his heart. Isn't it great when you get to be around wise people who don't have to fill the silence with all the noise? Guys and girls, I just want to encourage you, this week, just one practice, and again, I'm preaching in the choir right now, I promise you. I'm going to do this with you. What would happen if we just tried for, for a week, a day, maybe 10 minutes if it's hard for you guys, just to talk a little less, to not have to be the first one to answer, to not have to be the first one to blurt something out of your mouth, to not have to say the first thing that pops into your mind, but to listen to others, to ask questions. I think it would make an impact. And as the band comes up here and we continue to experience this service and worship our creator God together, I just want to ask you guys, just for a second, just to imagine, imagine what would happen if we practiced some of these things. It's not my advice. I'm just saying, imagine what would happen if we sought wisdom and found God. Imagine what would happen if in West Sacramento, a group of guys and girls decided that it was important enough to seek the heart of God with every fiber in their being. Imagine people's lives, how many lives would be changed for the kingdom of God. Imagine how many lives would be transformed in this room tonight. How many eyes would be opened to have the mind of the Messiah to see as Jesus sees, to speak as Jesus speaks, to listen as Jesus listens. Imagine what would happen. Imagine the impact in our community. Think about how many people would start to view Christians not so much for what they're against, but more for what they're for. Imagine the love that would explode from this place out into our world. Imagine that for just a moment. Can you stand with me as we pray? Jesus, Father God, Holy Spirit, we thank you for this night. God, I thank you for this group of guys and girls who are here committed to you. God, I'm not naive to the fact that there's probably some in here who don't fully know you, who aren't completely committed to you. God, that is okay. You know them. Your hand is upon them, even if they don't realize it yet. So God, I pray that through all your power, with all your power and might, that you would break into their lives that you would touch them with your love, touch them with your spirit, your grace, your truth right now in this moment. Jesus, I pray for changed lives. God, I ask that you would intercede on our behalf, God. Bible says that when we are, when we are weak, you, God, are strong. So God, for those of us in this place here gathered tonight, no matter where we are, where we are on our journey with you, God, intercede on our behalf. Thank you that you love us amidst our faults and weaknesses. God, we want you. We want you to be known throughout this greater Sacramento region. It doesn't matter what church we're at. This is your church. Jesus, we are your people. So God, interrupt our schedules. Help us to be quiet a little bit more often, to listen more often. Help us to seek your heart, to be okay to sit in the silence, even if it's awkward. God, we just want to know you more. We want to grow in our relationships with each other more and people we don't even know yet. So God, my last thing is, Jesus, we just say as a corporate body gathered here tonight, you have all the freedom in the world, all the space to move and to act as you so desire. God, we want to seek wisdom, knowing that we'll find you. God, bless this church. Bless this group. We worship you together now in this moment. Amen.